We're really, really lucky to have Jay Price here tonight. He's an associate professor at Wichita State University. He's also the author of several books, one of which is uh, titled Kansas in the Heart of Tornado Alley. And he's going to talk to us about the case study he's done on tornadoes. He said when I interviewed him, he said people in other states think that we're being hit by tornadoes here in Kansas every day and that we just have to <laughs> dodge them like crazy. And, and I thought that was really funny, but I know that is kind of, of a, a thought that people have, that we, we have to chase tornadoes every day. I was 21 years old before I saw my tor first tornado. And he said he's talked to people that are, are up in years, I believe is the way he put it, who've never seen one. But people outside of our state can't believe that. So, Jay, thank you so much for coming tonight. We're really looking forward to it, and we appreciate it. Everybody, welcome to it. The inspiration for this talk came in March of 2007, when my parents were visiting from New Mexico. I'm not and sure your mic is actually on. I'm sorry. Let's try it on. There we go. Better. <laughs> I might have hit it off. Um, my parents were visiting, and they were wondering what all the storm uh, announcements were. And I was sitting with them in their trail, and they said, oh, those things happen. Don't worry, don't worry. Well, then Greensburg comes on. And, okay, that's not normal. Uh, that's not every day. So uh, we learned about Greensburg that night as it was happening. And in response, it struck me how much tornadoes are a part of our lives here in this state, even for people who may never have seen one. It seems that everyone either has a tornado story or knows someone who certainly does. I started working with Arcadia, which specializes in local and community photo-based history. So that's what the, the publisher uh, that uh, produces this. The uh, the books that they come out are available in local bookstores. Some authors bring books to sell. Um, I'm not one of them. I tend to emphasize going to the local bookstores. So uh, you know, visit your, your local bookstore or talk to your local bookstore about perhaps getting something like this. And I'll pass this on in just a little bit here. We had discussed how to frame this conversation. I knew that Greensburg alone would be too detailed, and there was so much interest with Greensburg that there really wouldn't be an in, there, there would be saturating the market. We had talked about Tornado Alley in general, and that was too big a project to talk about tornadoes in a vast stretch of territory that goes from Canada down to Texas. That's way too big. And so we settled on Kansas itself, and that decision helped frame our conversation. And we got us to thinking a little bit more about, well, what does it mean to be a state so identified with tornadoes? The book is not a, an encyclopedic history of every tornadic event in the state. Uh, there are other books, Fitzgerald's, for example, that does a better job at that. This is a sampling. And invariably, there will be events that don't get covered in here, not because they're not important, but it's a sampling of what has happened. What we wanted to emphasize instead was the cultural aspects of living in Tornado Alley and the response of the emergency teams, the use of tornado imagery and art and so forth. That's what we wanted to, to uh, address. I put together a team of students as well as one other uh, colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Torbenson, who's a geographer. One requirement to be on the project, though, is that all of us had to go through storm spotter training hosted by the National Weather Service. And I do recommend everyone do that. This doesn't train you to go out and chase tornadoes. In fact, if anything, they encourage people not to do that. And we'll talk about some reasons why that might be. Instead, it gives you a sense of tornadic image, uh, terminology. How do tornadoes form? How do you respond to them? And each program is actually a little different. The notion of even training people, the average person, to look for tornadoes has its own history. Uh, going back to 1959, and indeed, you are very much 
part of that, Wellington, 1959, was one of the first major storm training sessions back then for local officials. But we'll talk about how we live with the tornado. And as was mentioned, we are associated with the funnel cloud. Kansas is almost de facto the tornado state. Even though some of the most vicious tornadic events that have happened in recent uh, years have taken place in Missouri or to the south. And like all stereotypes, whenever you hear something that just reinforces the stereotype. So when a tornado hits Chapman, well, that reinforces it's the tornado state. But we don't think of Alabama as the tornado state. We don't think of Massachusetts as the tornado state, even though tornadoes have hit there as well. So why? Snowden flora, one of the nation's first major meteorologists to study the tornado, based out of the National Weather Service office, the Weather Bureau office at the time, up in Topeka, said this in the 1919 Monthly Weather Review. A tornado, a tornado frequently misnamed a cyclone is the most spectacular of all storms known to inland America, especially so in the prairie states where the characteristic cloud can be plainly seen for miles. It is almost irresistible force and is so terrifying the damage and curious results of the enormous velocity of the whirling wind and sudden drop in pressure in the center of the vortex are so impressive that once seen, they are never forgotten. Well-built houses explode and are carried away in small pieces and stately shade trees that have sheltered generations for uh, families for generations are uprooted or have their limbs twisted off short as the whirling, writhing cloud descends from the sky and strikes them in its path. Yet perhaps a frail shanty within a few feet will escape without a board missing. It's the quirkiness, the freakiness of tornadoes and tornado, tornadic damage, I think, that brings the public attention to this. This is one of the very first uh, tornadoes ever photographed. This is in 1884, Anderson County. Um, probably heavily touched up, uh, and how much the touching up blurs what was there and how much of it, it accentuates what was there is a matter of some debate. Perhaps the most famous or infamous tornado photograph of the same year, by the way, 1884, is this from the Dakotas. Probably touched up with these little tendrils added in for dramatic effect. It's hard to tell. In a world of glass plate negatives, pho photographing something like this was a very great challenge indeed. Well, why here? What is it about the middle part of the continent of North America that makes us so tornado prone? And similar events will take place in any great continental landmass. But we are particularly influenced by a couple of features. First, we have the Rocky Mountains. And we have the Gulf Stream pouring over the Rocky Mountains with cold uh, or cool air clashing with warm air coming up from the Gulf of Mexico, Mexico, combining with the jet stream, and that confluence is what makes the powerful storms take place. It's that clash of hot and cold that make the violent weather possible. But even then, it, we're, always not, we're not always sure why tornadoes form, why does a certain a uh, system form and not others. We had the privilege of listening to Josh Werman, who from uh, one of the severe storm centers in Boulder. And he came out to speak to Wichita State, and we, we sat in on his lecture. And he pointed out the degree to which we know what happens way up in the atmosphere. We have a reasonably decent sense of what happens right on the ground. What happens in between, we don't know. And Doppler radar, incredibly important and yet is not the, the, the magic solution that people think it is. He pointed out a series of photographs of hook echo, hook echo, blob hook echo. 
The blob produced the tornado. The hook echoes did not. <laughs> which is why going out to photograph them is very dangerous, which is why it is not recommended for the average person to, uh, to go and do this. If we look at tornado incidents by state, again, this is from the National Weather Service. This is 1953 to 68. This, is the, this was the period that brought us Udall. This is the period that uh, brought Ruskin Heights. This is the period that brought us Topeka. And yet, you notice the upper figure of the total number of tornadoes, the lower figure of the total days in which tornadoes occur. So the number of tornadoes, we just look at the upper Period. Just over a thousand for us. Oklahoma, though, has just slightly more. But Kansas is the tornado state to a degree. Oklahoma just isn't quite. Texas has the most, but that's not surprising. It's got the biggest landmass to have storms appear on it. But you'll notice we have high incidences of tornadoes across the plains, up to the Dakotas. The term Tornado Alley comes from about 1904 or so. There are other designations. There's a Dixie Alley now in the south. There's a Hoosier Alley um, up around the Great Lakes. But you'll notice Maine had 53 tornadoes. But we don't think of Maine as the tornado state. Alaska had three. But Alaska isn't the tornado state. In the south, a lot of those tornadoes actually are out, uh, outcomes of uh, hurricanes. So when hurricanes slam onto shore, they'll spin off uh, tornadoes and vortices. Maybe by this, at this point, too, we should talk a little bit about terminology. A cyclone is any weather system that rotates. So a tornado is very much an example of this. So is a hurricane or a typhoon. I suppose on a small scale, so is a dust devil. <laughs> so that means then that all tornadoes are cyclones, but not all cyclones are tornadoes. <laughs> what caused these? Well, we're not, we weren't always sure. In fact, up until very recently, we handled tornadoes with essentially folklore more than anything else. You, say, you see this from uh, the Kansas Cyclopedia of 1912. The number of tornadoes occurred from 1880 to 1882 when there was but little rain, and, but none rec are recorded in the years 1883, 84, which actually is not at all true because we have photos from Anderson County in 1884, but there you go, when there was plenty of rain during the spring months. And in this part of the world, tornadoes tend to be a, a spring uh, event, not exclusively, but primarily so. In the south, they tend to be a late winter event. The tornadoes of 1881 owed their origin to the union of the two currents of air, one a cold, dry wind descending from the Rocky Mountains, and the other a warmer current heavily charged with moisture from the Gulf of Mexico. They got that right. When these met in Kansas within an atmosphere of high temperature and of almost complete saturation, the cold current attacked the warm one, and in the red rushing air developed the funnel-shaped cloud. Okay, well, you were getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> But then they say, with the extension of civilization westward and the cultivation of the soil, which enables it to retain more moisture, the planting of trees and the irrigation of districts once barren, destructive storms are growing less frequent. And it is probable that in a few years they will be a thing of the past. <laughs> they said this in 1912. Okay, not so accurate. This is also that classic model that they used to call the rain follows the plow, the belief that if you plow up land, that the moisture released and the, then the production of, of crops and so forth will bring in more, it will somehow attract moisture. And therefore, if moist periods have fewer tornadoes, that's what they're assuming. Rain does not follow the plow, and this is not correct. But it was about as good as almost anything else out there. The, st the study of severe weather alone has its own very long, complicated story. Basically, going back to the US Weather Bureau, initially, actually, it was the military, uh, the Signal Corps. That was the initial um, scholar, if you will, or source of scholarship for weather of all sorts, including tornadoes. Then the Weather Bureau takes on that function. 
the uh, and this is our friend Snowden Flora uh, right uh, uh, on the right here in, in Topeka. Initially, whether equipment was simply placed on whatever high building was available, whether a hotel, a post office, something like that. By the turn of the century, a number of weather stations will appear in Kansas as they do across the country that are specifically built for, the pur for this purpose. You have the Weather Bureau uh, station up in Dodge City, for example. Below is the one in Iola. People don't, remember, don't uh, often realize we had a Weather Bureau station in Iola. We had, one, we had one in Concordia. We have one in Goodland. And a lot of times their job was to read the, the charts as best they could. And they were really designed not for severe weather, but they were designed to help farmers adjust to whatever weather systems were coming their way or a cold front. And they would raise their flags up and you'd show that. Uh, my personal favorite anecdote of this, however, is the uh, Weather Bureau station up in Concordia that in its very early years would send out weather reports by postcard. <laughs> now you think, now what on earth were they thinking? But, but consider, in a world where you had perhaps two or three mail deliveries a day, it wasn't uncommon to have multiple mail deliveries uh, during a single day. So you could write, have your reports, write up your postcards, send out the postcards. The postcards would get there by the afternoon. So by the standards of its day, this was fairly efficient, all things considered. All right, we have to talk about this man. Why are we associated with, well, there are a couple of reasons. He doesn't help. Uh, L. Frank Baum was a, well, he had a variety of roles. He uh, did editing, he was a playwright, uh, he really actually fancied himself primarily as a playwright. His father helped to build him a theater, as a matter of fact. The story is that he was traveling around and perhaps got waylaid by some tornadoes when he was traveling in Kansas. Maybe. Who knows? Um, he had a lot of family in South Dakota. And there is also a school of thought that says that uh, Baum was actually talking about South Dakota when he wrote his book, the Wizard of Oz, uh, but didn't want to offend his Dakota relatives, so just planted it in Kansas. There's also an, a whole scholarship out there, a theory, that really this is an allegory on politics. Um, usually I don't go into that, but it's a, you're missing the debate, so I'm going to give you a political history anyway. Um, <laughs> The theory is this, it's called Wizard of Oz, A Parable of Populism, and it argues that L. Frank Baum was very interested in observing the political scene, and the book comes out in 1900 when William Jennings Bryan was running, again, for president. He's one of those people who wanted the presidency so bad he could taste it, sort of a figure. And there is a rule of, there's a hypothesis that the characters represent various aspects of the populist movement. Dorothy comes from Kansas, which is where populism really has its heart and its strength. Cowardly Lion, reformers. Scarecrow, farmers. The Tin Woodsmen are laborers. The Wicked Witch of the East are the, the big barons and financiers. The Wicked Witch of the West being the, the cattle barons and so forth, who of course is killed by water irrigation. Um, Dorothy herself has her little dog, Toto, teetotlers, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's possible. Uh, I actually argue that there is some element of truth to this because, you know, Baum never wrote in his own hand, I, I mean it to be this. There's no evidence of that. He himself argues that Oz came from looking at two file cabinets, A through N and O through Z. Maybe. Uh, but he is eerily commenting on a lot of things, including currency at a time when they were supporting uh, currency with metal. And initially, Dorothy's slippers were not ruby. They were silver. And ruby shows up better in films. That's why they did it that way. But so silver slippers on a yellow brick road, gold, to, uh, uh, ounces, emerald city money, and, and so on and so forth. Um, the wizard is the one character identified with the location. Not even Dorothy is claimed 
by is attributed to one location, not that liberal didn't think of it. Anyone know where the wizard's from? Omaha, Nebraska. He goes back to Omaha. Who's from Omaha, Nebraska? Who's the boy orator of the plat? William Jennings Bryan. So there you go. Um, and then there are a series of sequels to the book that are really kind of fun. Um, there's a return to Oz where General Ginger and her army of women take over Oz. And um, it's a not terribly flattering view of some aspects of the women's suffrage movement. Um, but that's a later conversation. Back to tornadoes. The tornado is largely just a device to get Dorothy into Oz so other things can be talked about. But in our modern memory of The Wizard of Oz, Oz and Kansas become conflated. They're sort of the same thing. I mean, the, the Scarecrow and the Carol Island, they never live in Kansas in the books, in the Milby. But in our memory, they're there at the same time. And so there's a lot of commentary on that. So that helps solidify the tornado image. But before there was L. Frank Baum, there was Irving. When people started settling in this area, I mean, they knew what cyclones were. They knew what big monster storms were like. Benjamin Franklin documented them. Um, the word tornado, by the way, is a Spanish term. Um, and it, it relates to the concept of turning, like a turn, like a plot twist is probably the closest turn. It has that component. It actually be, seems to have begun, uh, from what I can tell from at least uh, the dictionaries and so forth, as a maritime term, more of a water spout concept, and then moves on to land. So European settlers knew about this. Native Americans certainly knew about it. And there are stories about, especially among, the, say, the Lakota, uh, about the four winds being four brothers, and then there's Yumni, the whirlwind, who is, on the one hand, a mischievous character, on the other hand, is a symbol of warrior power and represented by a cocoon. And so they, there, are, there were awarenesses of this. But when settlement, white settlement starts coming into the area, these major storms are perfect fodder for the media of the time, the sensational media. It, if it bleeds, it leads is not a new concept. It was very much in evidence in the 19th century. And when Irving, Kansas is hit, May 30th, 1879, and Irving is uh, almost to the Nebraska border, it's the northern part of, uh, of the state. First tornado hits the northern part, second tornado hits the southern part, 66 deaths. And we become the cyclone state in the wake of Irving. The graphic, brutal nature of the destruction, where victims are depicted, are, are described as denuded and their heads stuck in the mud, upside down. One victim was, in fact, a woman named Dorothy Gale, so making some wonder whether that was the inspiration for the character of the Wizard of Oz. Hard to say, of course. But it attracts national attention. In fact, this gets the Signal Corps interested in severe weather. And a fellow by the name of John Finley comes out to study the aftermath. And it was one of the first attempts to try to figure out what happened by look, looking at the wreckage and the debris. Here's, for example, from, uh, uh, from Irving's chart. And so he's looking at where the damage was. And you know, there's, here's number one. You can see where it goes. Here's number two. And trying to show patterns and trying to piece together almost the way we would piece together an accident or a crime scene. But this is the first time they're actually starting to do that. But you get, for example, the Osage County tornado of 1881, three deaths, three wounds, a dark, ugly, funnel-shaped cloud formed about the center of the storm. And as it rose and fell, it began to sweep down the river. Everyone knew what it meant. Everyone, everybody knew that ruin and death would mark its course. I mean, this is the type of stuff that journalists and publishers at the time brought out again and again and again. So here we go. Here's the Osage County tornado. And you know, trying to depict what this is. And you can only imagine what someone in Pennsylvania is thinking reading this. And again, you're kind of re you know, again, that emphasis of 
whatever happens in Kansas has better be dramatic. <laughs> and so, and if you ever look at our modern media to this day, which tends to be based on the East Coast, if anything happens in Kansas, it's sensational, it's unusual, it's quirky, it, yeah, and tornadoes fit that bill quite handsomely. Of course, here, Wellington struck at 9 p.m., intensified as it goes through down to 17 deaths, became one of the most uh, photographed tornadoes to date. Devastating. In fact, a picture of the Lutheran Church upturned is in your calendar, as a matter of fact. The Great Bend Tornado sounded like a hundred locomotives. But here's the thing, farmers just a few miles away didn't even know it happened. And people start visiting. There's a curiosity. They want to see what happened. We'll see in particular some examples of that in a little bit. A necktie rack with ties still on it. I suppose they've been transported miles and miles away. The wall is gone, but the canned goods remained. A canceled check was found 300 miles away. Splinters were supposedly found inside an iron water hydrant. And then they talk about an iron jug blown inside out and a rooster blown. I mean, and all major tornadic events have stories like this, which are very difficult, if not impossible, to, to verify. But the colorful nature of the damage um, makes good press as well. And then great band from this, the, the flour mills. In 1917, a Toyota touchdown by Cheney tore through Andale, Sedgwick, and Florence. 23 deaths, 70 injured. At a time when people simply don't know how to respond. You don't know the tornado is there until it's upon you. There's no way to, to, to really get a sense of what's going on. And so people are relying on folklore. Well, the sky doesn't look right, or a tornado won't strike the same place twice or not. There's Andale, or what was left of it. The mythology of, the, of a tornado never striking the same place twice, well, how about three times? Take the poor town of Codell. On May 20th, 1916, 1917, and 1918. Each of the same day, three years, Codell. Right, yeah, people <laughs> probably figure out they're doing something here. Where's Codell located? Codell is um, in north central Kansas, not too terribly far from Lincoln. Brooks County. Liberal. Hidden in a dust storm. 165 homes, 44 business damages destroyed. Um, and even then, these aren't the most famous of the, the tornadoes. You, the most famous, the most vicious, the most well-known of the tornadoes that happened in the early part of the 20th century was in 1927, the tri-state tornado, which we were not part of. The, this is more part of the Hoosier Alley. But we, start, we see photos like a beam thrust through another beam, forming almost a cross-like pattern. Again, liberal. <coughs> but with destruction comes rebuilding. You'll hear a new liberal is here, a better liberal, to gain uh, the lead in the Southwest to great prosperity. So sometimes communities will, when they're hit by a tornado, will use that as the beginning of the end. Others will use a tornado or tornadic event as a rallying point to rebuild. Or we take the most famous or infamous of the Kansas tornadoes, Udall, May 25th, 1955. 
and F5, if we at least going looking back on it. Now we'll talk about what that means in a second. 80 deaths, 270 injured, deadliest, hitting at 10, 10 p.m. There was a belief that tornadoes didn't happen at least too late at night. Well, Wellington would, would tell you different regard on that as well, as did uh, Udall. It was one of the first uh, years that the government actually allowed tornado watches. The Weather Bureau was actually, uh, officials were uh, forbidden for much of the 20th century from talking about the T word because they thought it would spark panic. <laughs> Again, the devastation. The downtown. And you know, some communities remember and others do not. Um, Codell has the, the tornadic uh, storms of 16, 17, 18 very much part of its identity. You go to the historical museum at Udall, you don't, it's in the back. You don't see, have anybody, have, have any of you been to the historical museum in Udall? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's in the back. I mean, there are other aspects. You know, don't just remember us for a tornado. We're more than that. I mean, communities have different ways of approaching that. Food and drink. When so many people were starting to come by to gawk that the community started charging visitors a small token, and they used that as part of the relief effort. <laughs> um, and people would come by to help. One of my very dear friends came, it was at uh, Southwestern at the time and helped right in the wake of that. Uh, and one of his you know, very graphic events and stories, um, a lot of things he still doesn't talk about. One thing he did mention, though, was, this, was the house that was gone, except for a table with a runner and a fish in the fishbowl still swimming around. But the rest of the house was gone. And burning the wreckage of what had le been left. It's the football field now. And then you start rebuilding almost immediately. There's a tornado in Wichita in the northeastern portion of the city uh, in 1965. An F3, 27 injured. Most of the area is about 13th and Woodlawn, if you're familiar with that part, uh, part of the city. And there was a belief that Wichita would be spared because we had the confluence of the two rivers. Not true. And then there's Topeka, another F5. 66 deaths, 460 injured. The first tornado to have over a million dollars in damage. 10 million at Washburn University alone. One of the buildings destroyed was the building that housed the original site of the Weather Bureau station, which had by long, then long since been transferred out to the airport. By the post-war years, the airports were really where the weather stations were. But the irony is that that, that building itself was also gone. And then there was the belief that Burnett's Mound would protect the city. Abram Burnett, a Potawatomi chief, um, had stipulated that this would be a sacred place and that no one should disturb those who were buried around it. Well, the story seems to have validity when the city decides to build a huge water tank on Burnett's Mound and now a tornado, a tornado hits the city. Okay, this is on uh, Washburn's uh, campus. The post-war years really do change dramatically how we interact with severe weather. And there are a couple of reasons for this. One is the use of radar. 
And very early on, once radar came of, of widespread use, there was a realization that it shows not just enemy aircraft, but also shows weather currents. And so that's, this becomes a useful tool. Doppler radar, the notion that, the, that there's a shift in the frequency of, of, pa of the bouncing waves as a storm moves across, suggested a great usefulness. And it, one of the first experimental stations takes place in Wichita in 1959 at the weather station there. But it's too preliminary. It's just not sophisticated enough to be of much use. So we're not going to see Doppler radar as we would understand it until the 1990s. Then you have the uh, interior of the uh, weather station. You have down here Tinker Air Force Base, 1948. This was very significant because it was the first time that meteorologists working with the newly created Air Force, and up until pretty recently, your really top-notch uh, meteorologists came out of the Air Force. That's where your weather, big weather training took place. And these uh, meteorologists notice there are set, certain sets of conditions and what's going to interact with what in terms of air masses. And they wonder if this set of conditions will produce a tornado. Well, a tornado hits Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma City. They notice the very next day a similar setup is going to take place. And they say to the installation commander, be prepared, we think one's going to hit. And it does. And it's one of the first times that the use of predicting or the attempt to predict where a storm might go takes place. Now, again, this is within the military. Again, there is still this prohibition against using the T word, really until the 60s. It was to the point that meteorologists would, the, the most warning you could give was get on the phone, talk to your friends in the local media, and say, yeah, how's it going? How are the kids? Yeah, yeah, by the way, we think there might be some tornadoes. I mean, that was, that was how warnings took place. And uh, you know, up until that time, people were sky watching. People were looking around saying that you could do, that you could tell by a certain arrangements of color in the sky. Um, and there were lots of, especially early photos of people standing there looking, because that's what you did. Uh, and I've talked to a number of people who talk about uh, gender in this. When things look bad, the women and children get into the cellar, and dad will stand out to look. And when dad runs in, you know it's bad. <laughs> the post-war years also bring us the fear of atomic war, which brings with it a whole set of facilities that actually help us not so much with an attack from Moscow, but with tornadic weather. Sirens, which are initially part of a civil defense system, are certainly part of our, our everyday lives today. The use of not just dugouts, but actual fallout shelters or store bomb shelters as safe places in, in the event of severe weather is also part of the story. I'll just say, Wellington, one of the first places to bring officials together. Okay, what do you do when severe weather happens? How do you respond to it? How do you think about it? Um, Udall's event was one of the things that really springboards this into local understanding, suggesting that there will be um, you know, a need for officials to, to address this. It's during this time then, then that scholarship work on tornadoes starts to become more and more evident. Um, another set of events will give rise to better and better um, uh, discussions of how tornadoes function and go. So um, the 1965 Palm uh, Sunday tornado, this is in Michigan. My father took these photographs, as a matter of fact. Um, inspired a young meteorologist by the name of Ted Fujita to look again at the pattern of damage and saying, OK, we need to, to get a better sense of this. And by studying them, he classified them. And that's where we get the Fujita scale from. But here's the thing, and Andover shows this. It's based on damage. It's based on structural elements. And you could have 
a really severe, vicious uh, tornado go through a wheat field, and you'll never know how bad it was. When you have a, an event that will go through a populated area, like Andover, like South Wichita, then you'll see the damage. You can start seeing patterns and so forth. There might be more. There might be less. There seems to be some belief that uh, F or e, uh, EF uh, threes tend to, two to three tends to be the most common, but we're still not totally sure. It's still aftermath. Again, one of the most uh, well-known for, for the Wichita area, uh, April 26, 1991. F2 to F5, depending on when it, uh, you're talking about it. Especially damage to McConnell Air Force Base including this famous image. Uh, there are now motion pictures of this. Um, the man who took the famous video of the storm going across McConnell got into massive trouble because he is out there saying, OK, it's going across. It's hitting our bombers. It's hitting da, 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 da. He outlines exactly what's on them. And so you've now just outlined for all the world to hear exactly the strategic location of every major facility on McConnell Air Force Base. Thank you. <laughs> We've got another picture here. Here it is with the aircraft right below it. Um, McConnell, by, by contrast, has embraced in some ways the tornado event as a cornerstone of its identity. Uh, the, the officer's court is called the storm shelter. There are a lot of uh, you know, storm-related types of, uh, of uh, features on the, on the installation to this day now. And then you can see going right across. And you see again homes, motor home, mobile homes, and so forth. Um, by the way, there, you, let's address this stereotype now about mobile homes and tornadoes. <laughs> I mean, that's one another reason why we tend to think of very severe weather hitting because they don't have a lot of resistance. A strong brick building might withstand a very modest tornado that a mobile home simply could not. So we've got to see more damage from it. Uh, Udall, right, one of my very favorite ads from the Udall Historical Museum, shows this big front page ad advertising a new Udall being rebuilt with manufactured housing. Come see our new mobile homes in Udall. I mean, they didn't make the association that we do. Uh, Mike Smith, who is in charge of weather data, um, even pointed out a couple of years ago a tornado did actually grace a, or, 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 or swipe a, a place that makes manufactured housing and saying, oh, see, they're going out to the source. <laughs> People, when you talk to people who've been through tornadoes, a lot of times they talk about the silence right after. The other thing they mention is the smell. A lot of times people talk about the smell, this earthy, muddy smell, where so much has been turned up and the trees have been you know, uprooted and so forth. And there we see it. This is going to be uh, Andover. But again, you get not too terribly far away. Uh, you know, and this is also that challenge of looking at damage cores. Here, you see a lot of severe damage. So, oh, well, it's an EF or it's an F, fill in the blank. But if you're over here, well, it might be just an F1. Depends on where it hits and at what phase, what, how close to the center it is and so forth. Greensburg, of course, first EF5, an enhanced Fujita scale. Levels 95% of the town. Uh, the town embracing a green image now as it's rebuilding. Part of that, of course, is due to the name. Had Greensburg been Kiowa City, I doubt seriously it would have taken the green technology. So, um, and it, it's fascinating to hear about how the rebuilding is playing into local identity. Here's the, the wedge tornado. And uh, 
those who are the storm spotters and storm chasers so who talk about wedges and funnels and stove pipes and, and so forth, um, they generally don't use the term twister. That's a popular term. They don't, the, the, the true weather weenies, as they're sometimes called, uh, use other terminology. <laughs> Here again, on Greensburg. Uh, but it, it prompted such a response, and there are a couple of reasons for this. One, this is the anti-Katrina. This comes just not too far after the heels of Katrina. We're not going to do that again, and so there's a lot of money poured into Greensburg to try to rebuild as fast as possible, and a lot of pop publicity, especially with celebrities and so forth. Um, sometimes the community has really embraced it. Sometimes they, OK, now what do we do? The, and, and then we start seeing communities within Kiowa County. Um, I've talked to some people who, who hint that the rival community of Haviland, that county seat rivalry, played up here. And Haviland, not wishing at all ill of their neighbors in Greensburg, not for a moment. And at the same time saying, maybe this is time to move the county seat where it should have been all along. The big well. Uh, I just bought a new camera in April of 2007. And I was driving back, and I'd hit Greensburg about dusk. And I loved taking pictures of Greensburg. It's a very photogenic little town. And so that's OK. I'll be back in a couple of months uh, for a conference. And well, no. It took me 15 minutes to find the big well, because there were no landmarks anymore. In the Dillon store. <laughs> and just recently, when this book came out, one of its main debut came from a storm spotter meeting at Exploration Place. And it was held April 14th. Um, in fact, we had initially planned uh, Chance Hayes, who is fantastic as a speaker for uh, weather watching and, and awareness and so forth. He was going to be the keynote speaker. He couldn't make it that day because they were too busy watching this confluence of things that were going to look really bad. And you knew it was going to get bad when the, uh, you know, they shut down Wichita and shift everything to Topeka because we're about ready to get hit. And it got really scary. I mean, I was ready. I mean, I had things, you know, I had the, the cats were in the cage and they were downstairs and I had the computer ready and then boom, it turned and there they went there. It flanked us. But it reminds us how vulnerable we can be. My father texted that night saying, you'll do anything to sell a book, won't you? <laughs> You know, Spirit Aero Systems. Somebody's asking me, am I a storm chaser? No. Um, I actually had the privilege and honor of talking with one of the very, very, very first storm chasers. His name is David Hoadley. Um, he, uh, came, he, would, he travels across the country looking at storms. He started doing this in the 50s. And the story is that a reporter was asking him, well, why are you doing this? And well, he talked about the, these reasons for it. And the, the comment was made in the process that, yeah, you're so busy chasing tornadoes, you're not chasing girls. <laughs> and the, David Hoadley did say he's chased storms every single year, with the exception of one year, and that was the year of his honeymoon. Uh, he's the one who also gave me uh, a number of sets of cartoons. He has a wonderful, he's a great cartoonist. And uh, a couple of his uh, cartoons appear in the book. Uh, one of them is the Muji to scale, for example. <laughs> but as, through the humor, he, there's a bite to it. And he encourages responsible storm behavior. He is a professional. You know, do not go and do this yourself. We've been lulled into a false sense of security in the thinking that, oh, well, now it's, we, we can download a, you know, weather, the weather radar on our phone. We'll go out and take a look. No. 
Leave it to people like Bryce Kintai. This is, you know, if you ever see on uh, channel uh, three, um, you, you'll hear Bryce sometimes. I did ride with him a little bit. I very much learned I don't have the driving skills to be a chaser. But then you have, for example, Vortex 2, a consortium of different organizations coming together to, uh, prom to promote better study of weather. And, the, and one issue, and this comes out of the, the radar issue, if you're close to a, uh, an object, radar works great. The more and more distant you get from an object, the weaker and weaker the si signal is. So you want to get as close as you can. Well, how do you get close to it? Well, they come up with the idea that we send people out, like grad students, out <laughs> close to this. And you can, I can only imagine what the, the university lawyers are thinking about this one. Um, but you got to get close, or at least you got to have these portable mobile units um, going out to, to get close to them to get a better image of it. But again, these are people trained to deal with it. And even they'll get crossways. You make one wrong move, and it's Irving for you. So what do we do with this? How do we respond to it? One, another issue that was striking to us, there are no building codes for tornadoes. Earthquakes, yes. Hurricanes, yes. Tornadoes, not so much. We're just now starting to think about that. And how would you protect against an EF5 that can take pavement off of the parking lot? This is a, uh, it's now Galicia. Uh, it was the, the Galicia Hospital in Wichita. It was built, though, back when that was initially meant to be a computer tech area. That was basically the, the database storage area. For, for a company. And so they decided, because they're from outside of Kansas and they assume we're hit by tornadoes like on a regular basis, we're going to make this thing that you can deflect off uh, severe weather and so So this is meant to be relatively tornado proof. That's why you have these angled sides on and so forth. Okay. This is Greensburg. Here's the new city building. Here is the new circular concrete house. It's supposed to be relatively impervious to strong storms and so forth. They've dropped cars on it and it survives and so forth. But then we have the cultural side. This has become more visible in more recent years. Um, this, the tragic prelude, John Stuart Curry's famous, infamous, beloved, despised mural about Kansas's origins. Essentially uh, depicting bleeding Kansas with the tornado in the background. Kansas, when this was debuted in the 1930s, Kansans hated it. How dare you portray us this way? Uh, so much so that things fell apart and uh, John Stewart, they, they created an incident so it couldn't, the whole mural pattern couldn't be finished and Curry got all uh, wound up and stomped off in a huff and never signed it. So that's how that works. And this is what people think of with Kansas. These photos were collected in the wake of Andover, never claimed. 20 years later, they were brought out again in the city hall and laid out so people could go through and I was listening to people say, oh, there's aunt so-and-so. They were finally coming home 20 years later. And others take a little more of a quirky side of it. A club owner and his colleague Wes Race we're speculating, why did tornadoes hit so many trailer parks? And so well, let me talk about that. Well, it kind of came up, well, why not celebrate it in a warped way? And so in the 80s, they created this event called the Tornado Bait Party. Hey, for Tornado Bait anyway, why not embrace that? And they had a whole EMS-themed event and so forth. Wes Race gave the, uh, the poem. He created this poem. All the mobile homes are huddled on the outskirts of the town with their radios turned on wishing they were underground because a surrealistic dandy about one mile high has made up his mind to jump out of the southwestern sky. Tornado bait we've been living on the moment uh, on a real open play acting really naughty has been our order of the day. Our false pleasures getting more expensive every day. The sudden shock of recognition has blown us all away. Tornado bait 
Tornado Bait Party. It's a Midwestern affair. Tornado Bait, it's been an all-day bash. Tornado Bait Party, I've just heard some windows crash. Tornado Bait Party, everyone's in the groove. Tornado Bait Party, I just felt the trailer move. <laughs> Tornado Bait Party, smack dab in the whirlwind's path. Tornado Bait Party, not thinking about the aftermath. And if you today go, for example, up on the turnpike, you'll see lots of little snow globes with tornadoes in them. Uh, oh, I, because tornadoes are usually spring events, I argue they're hail globes, not snow globes. Um, or either t-shirts. You start seeing more and more of this image. There's artwork now that uses tornadoes and the whirlwind and the vortex and, and so forth. And that is becoming part of our identity. I'm seeing this, our artists more and more capturing that image, partly because it's an identifiable image. and It's something that is starting to become more and more visible, as tragic, as horrific as many of these are. And so the tornado has become a Kansas symbol, much as the earthquake is for California and the volcano is to Hawaii. My uncle lives in the, the San Francisco Bay Area, and he still wonders how safe I am. <laughs> You know, it's bright, sunny, no clouds, pretty much guaranteed no tornadoes that day. Um, he can see the San Andreas Fault. I'll take the tornadoes, thank you. Well, with that, um, thank you so much for the talk. I did want to end by talking about some other events had taking place this week. This is a busy week for lots of activities. One, uh, I am on the board of the Wichita Central County Historical Museum, and I can never give a talk without plugging the organization. Uh, tomorrow night at the museum, 7 o'clock, we're having a talk of uh, an author who has studied, in particular, Ulysses S. Grant. So for you Civil War historians, would definitely do well to come up and uh, take a look at uh, some of the things that we have of the Historical Museum and then listen to uh, Dr. Brand talk. Because you are in a historical society involved with the Historical Museum, the Kansas Museums Association, the statewide organization for the promotion of good practices, best practices in museum management, is taking place here, or actually in Newton, so it's not too terribly far away, uh, starting on Wednesday night through uh, Friday noontime. But take a look at Kansas Museums, ksmuseums.org. Uh, look at Kansas Museums Association. You can get all the information. It's at the Kaufman Museum, primarily. But very much worth going to. If you're interested in doing more with your facility and so forth, this is the place to go. These are your peers, your colleagues. If you want feedback, what am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? Hey, look at what we're doing. These are the folks you need to talk to. So highly, highly recommend it. And then, at the same, and then finally, I want to remind you to check out the National Weather Service. And consider attending storm spotter training talks. It's not training you to go out and hunt for the tornadoes. Please don't. You'll be, and if you, do you talk, if you talk to the people who help Clara clean up after a tornado, you'll just be in the way, unless you know what you're doing. Um, and there are those who are involved in specific rescue missions and activities. The Red Cross, the Salvation Army, uh, your local emergency management or team will all help you. There are those, um, Dr. Uh, Scare, Scare Veterinary <coughs> Hospital has a, an animal rescue just for those dealing with pets and other animals in the wake of storms. But there's training involved and you need to, to think about this you know, with some seriousness. Um, if you're going out just for fun, you're doing the wrong thing. And finally, pay attention. Something that Chance Hayes said on the 14th, or actually his colleague did on the 14th, excuse me. If you hear the sirens, it's too late. We tend to rely on the sirens. First of all, sirens are an outdoor um, mechanism. If you're indoors, you may or may not be able to hear it. Watch the news, watch, listen to the radio, watch your neighbors. If you get prepared, that's the number one thing that causes people to act, seeing other people act. You preparing things in a rational, orderly way 
can really make the difference between life and death. And if the storm passes and you have not been affected, you can do what my neighbor did up in Emporia when the storm when the storm hit, and everybody afterwards looked, went to look out, and they saw nothing had happened. It was at supper time. They had their pots and pans with them. They held a block party. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any questions, comments, recollections? Ma'am. I was in the April 14th tornado. Mm -hmm. By Argonia, Kansas. Mm -hmm. My daughter tried to get me to go to town to the church basement. I had a lot of trees along the road. I decided to wait it out in the house. I was in a small closet next to the door that goes to the double car garage. It folded the walls and the roof on my car and my pickup. Didn't break a window on the car or the pickup or the house. It tore a lot of damage to the siding on the house and took the shingles off the roof. Uh. Took all my outbuildings totally gone. Mm -hmm. I do think, since I live on the Shikaski River, that there was at least seven small tornadoes that came through there. Right. Yeah, that was an amazing, that was a, even, even very experienced weather people were really spooked by this one. Yeah. That's the one that hit the ones in Wichita. Yes, yes, across the state, really. There you are. Thank you for sharing that. My daughter tried to get me to go to town. <laughs> Do you yeah. wish you'd she, gone? She's still not nudging me. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you made it, and that's what that was good. You went to an interior closet, and that's the right thing to do, too, if you don't have the a basement. Bathroom has Glass doors and, yep. and I thought that was the smallest, safest place. And yep. The only thing that fell in the house was the thermometer above the kitchen sink. How ironic. Everything in the house was okay. You're fortunate on that. You better believe it. And, and, and we've, we've taken different approaches to severe weather. For a long time, the motto was open up the windows because it was the pressure mm -hmm. that does. We now realize that's not the case at all. But again, they weren't, they were doing the best they could. Anything else? Yeah. Um, I think it was the tornado that hit Hayesville. If it wasn't the same tornado, it was the same day, the mm -hmm. one that went through all through there. And it came through around Mayfield, just west of Mayfield, about mm -hmm. two miles. And it hit, uh, it went on my mom's <coughs> land, it went down kind of the hedgerow, but then it went um, across the road and missed the neighbor's house by probably not even a football field. Wow. And I asked her, I said, where were you? And I actually saw it that day. We were coming home from Wichita, we saw it. And I asked her, I said, where were you? They're gone now. But I asked her, I said, where were you? And she said, we were standing on the front porch. Mm -hmm. She said, we no, they weren't watching it. They couldn't even see it. It was rain wrap. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. It was rain wrap, That's... and they couldn't even see it. And they were standing on the porch, and I just so it gives me the heebie because they were so close. Thank you so much, Terry, for making that observation about rain. And that's the other reason why you don't want to go out and take a look at these. One, you're, you're clogging up the, the roads. You're keeping people who are doing their real job from doing their job. Um, but also, you're going into a wall of, of um, mist. You have no idea what's in there. And even professionals don't know what's going on in there. Um, and the way that generally seems to happen for structural reasons, when the storm goes across, there'll be heavy downpours, and then there will be this shelf trailing towards the rear. And then it's in there that you have the wall cloud, and then the funnel will drop from that. Um, and so the, the, the story is first the rain, then the pain. But at that same time, um, you, that's different from, say, a squall line, which is a very long, and a shelf cloud, which is this long, narrow piece that goes across, and it can be just as damaging with straight line winds. Straight line winds can be just as damaging as a tornado, as they kind of force themselves out of the, the storm. Um, and if you really want cost, although tornadoes can be expensive, excuse me, the most costly aspects of severe weather are hail and flooding. So it's still even beyond tornadoes. Thank you. Yeah. And if you have a hail, 
rest bad storm warnings, the hail will come before the tornado. Right. Hmm. And it's usually an annual cloud, mm -hmm. as you can see. Uh, we've been hit very lightly with two tornadoes, the third Saturday in August, a year apart. Mm -hmm. And uh, we lived the house, our house on the hill. And it came below the hill, took out trees, jumped over our house, took out a chimney, a tree in front of our house, jumped over the barn, trash barrel still standing, took out more trees, went to our neighbors, mm -hmm. damage and all. The second year, it was white. It looked, when you looked down, it was white. Wow. And I guess it was a white tornado. Right. And in the two years, it took out 21 trees for us. Wow. wow. <laughs> it can be powerful. But no, no uh, structural damage. And, and people will, there is a Kansas element, we will go out to look, that, that, that is sort of part of Kansas, not recommended, it's still part of Kansas culture, because we do see the, uh, they are identifiable. I um, mean, it is amazing that we sometimes talk about tornadoes, uh, almost like we talk about wild animals, uh, we, you, whereas, tor whereas hurricanes are named, they're given almost like personalities, like people who do things. Tornadoes don't quite do that, they're too numerous. But we'll trade like a, like a herd of wild bison. You know, watch it, just don't get too close. We tend to have that attitude. But yeah, you, you, you're a perfect example again of hitting the same day a year apart. Mm -hmm. There we go. So you know firsthand tornadoes can indeed strike mm -hmm. the same place twice. Any other uh, comments or questions? There's a place south of Argonia on the Argonia Road that's been hit four times. Mm. That hill. Wow. Thank you. They decided not to rebuild anything there. Right. Four times. <laughs> See, no. They bought a house in Argonia, and somebody said, I hope they're not moving close to me. <laughs> <laughs> There was definitely that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, you know, I, I've heard of Codell. I have not heard of a place that was struck four times. Thank you. Right. Well, with that, you keep in mind, how do you document this? I, I always have to end in my uh, talks with the Appeal for Preservation. Uh, remember events. How, what are people going to remember about if a tornado hits? How would they know about it? Are you going to photograph it? Do you keep memory? Do you keep recollections? Make sure the historical museum gets them. Make sure they're in good condition. Say, you know, in acid-free conditions. The Kansas Museums Association will help you with that. Uh, but keep that, that documentation in mind. Think about well, what, people, what are people going to remember about it? Because there are a lot of places that have very major tornadic events that you would never know about. They just prefer to, remember, to ignore it. Others, it's heart and soul of who they are. So think a little bit about that. Thank you so much for this opportunity. <laughs>